Welcome. Thank to you. Bell. Okay. <laughs> and welcome to today's uh, Dharma talk to start the day off. Hi. And for today's Dharma talk, I one thing which I haven't said much about yet is the practice of insight. So this morning's talk is going to be about insight meditation. Not the insight meditation you've heard before, but how we use insight, we use our wisdom to deepen our meditation practice. And it's not as if the insight is something apart from stillness, but stillness and insight usually travel together. And one of those similes which I just remembered uh, was the simile of the, the two um, partners, Vi and Sam. And Vi and Sam were devoted meditators. Some of you know where the story is going. Vi and Sam were devoted meditators. They lived together. Uh, the full name was Vi Pasana and the partner Sam Atta. So Sam Atta and Vi Pasana lived together, devoted to meditation. And one day they decided to go up uh, to Meditation Mountain for a lovely walk. And they took their two dogs with them. One of the dogs was, <laughs> was called Meta and the other dog was Anna. Uh, Anya. <laughs> Anna. <laughs> Anapana, Anapana. So Vi and Sam, together with their two dogs, went up a walk on Meditation Mountain. Sam's main purpose to walk up Meditation Mountain was the great peace and stillness which was there. He loved the silence and the stillness. Even just the stillness had a quality to it, which so regenerated him and gave him beautiful energy and peace. He loved it up there. And Vi, she was a professional photographer. So she took her incredibly expensive Canon photo, uh, camera up there to be able to take these incredible views over the whole uh, surroundings of the countryside. You could see everything up on top of Meditation Mountain. And as for Anna uh, for Meta, the dog, I often think that dogs are much wiser than human beings because they just went up there for the fun and joy of going a walk up Meditation Mountain. So the two dogs went along as well, just with a simple intention of just enjoying the moment. And by the time they got halfway up Meditation Mountain, it was so peaceful up there that Sam was just enjoying the silence and the rest which you could experience in the peace which surrounded him. And Vi was taking these amazing photographs, even halfway up, you could see so deeply into the nature and structure of the world around her. And Meta the dog, Meta the dog, she was just happy, wagging her tail, enjoying herself. And Anapana, the other dog, or well, Anapana was getting more and more subtle. And it's amazing, she was beginning to disappear. But even though that Sam went up there for the peace, he also enjoyed the view and enjoyed the happiness halfway up, just like Meta the dog did. And when they finally got to the top of Meditation Mountain, at the top of Meditation Mountain, it was so still on the top of Meditation Mountain that Sam was just drinking all the tranquility he could into his body and mind. It was perfect stillness up there. But he also had a pair of eyes and could see an incredible view of everything in the whole universe, it seemed to him. His insight was laid out before him. And he also enjoyed the happiness up there. And Vi, she was taking these amazing photographs. Even though that uh, it was very still up there, she respected that stillness so much that she pressed the button on her camera so silently, it didn't interfere with the stillness at all. But she also just respected that stillness so much. And Meta the dog, as dogs usually do when they're up on top of the mountain, it just sat there, perfectly still, 
with her eyes open, just enjoying the amazing view in all directions. But if you notice, it was, she was still wagging her tail. And the reason was because up on top of Adapana had disappeared by now. Because when you get to the top of the depths of meditation, the breath doesn't, it's not needed anymore, it becomes still. But anyway, on top of meditation mountain, the stillness, the insight, and the joy coexist. You may think you're going up there for one, but the other two go along as well. That's one of the ways you know that you have got into deep states of stillness. You have the insight that these deep states of stillness are full of joy. Very tranquil joy, but very powerful joy. And also, you get deep insight up there. You're very, very, very tranquil. So these things always go together. I do recall when Ajahn Chah would be asked about what is the difference between samatha vipassana? What's the difference between calm and insight? And because he did not have many visual aids to use, he would just hold up his hand. And he would say, now you can see the front of my hand. You can't see the back of my hand. Now you can see the back of my hand. You can't see the front. But even though you can see the back of my hand, you can't see the front. The front is still there because the front of the hand and the back of the hand always come together, just like Samatha and Vipassana. One may be the most visible, it's going in front, but the other one is always going right behind. You may think you are not doing insight meditation when you're doing calm meditation, but you always will be. You may not think you're doing insight meditation when you're doing calm, but you are. The two always go together. That's how Ajahn Chah taught. So how are we using insight to get into deep states of meditation? What we're really doing there is... Again, seeing that all these five senses and the body and all the things related to those five senses, they're all not me, not mine, not a self. Imagine you really understood that and you accepted that. That you know, your uh, vihara does not belong to you, Ayachanda, it's not yours. <laughs> Your body doesn't belong to you. It's not yours. <laughs> Your family don't belong to you. They're not yours. If you could really see that and understand that, imagine what would happen. What would happen would be you feel this great sense of freedom. You care for beings. You care for the vihara in which you live. You look after your body. You don't overdo it. Sometimes that when we, uh, we have a body, we should look at the, uh, the instructions uh, or you know, what actually comes with this body. I've seen in my body, there's a little stamp somewhere, I won't show you it, and it says, best before 19... <laughs> oh, no, so best before 2021. That's when I had my 70th birthday. <laughs> And after 2021, you start to decay. <laughs> and so that's just what happens. Now, the best years of my life are gone past now. Oh. But it's a weird thing, though. As a monk, I think it would be lovely to spend the last years of my life as a monk, nice and peaceful, just like the old cows. They put them out to grass and pasture because they're not useful for anything. It'd be wonderful if you can find some little paddock somewhere and just put me out to pasture so I can live my last years in peace, <laughs> peace and tranquility. But it doesn't work like that as a monk, because a monk, the older you are, the harder you have to work. Same happens with a nun, too. So it's really unfair. I always used to say the holy life, like being a holy man or a holy nun, that only starts at 70. I mean, people say the life begins at 40 or whatever, but the holy life. Because when you're about 70, they may think maybe after all those years, you may have learned something. 
And anyhow, so how is, let's go back onto the subject. Understanding what insight, what wisdom is, often it comes to the point that you are sitting down to meditate. You've just had a lovely meditation yesterday and you wonder why you don't get a good meditation today. Why? All seems the same. Yesterday was peaceful, was wonderful, blissful, and today it just doesn't happen. Why? And so the story I often tell was of this migrant who came to England on a boat across the channel. He was a doctor in his home country, a medical doctor, but his qualifications were not recognized uh, in the UK. He was with his family, and so when he came here, he had to get whatever job he could find. And the job which he got was on a building site, which is quite common. He was you know, pretty fit and healthy. So he got a job on a building site, and he worked so hard all day on Monday. And after he went home, his wife said, how much did you earn today? He said, nothing. They didn't pay me anything at all. And he went to work on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. The same thing happened. Worked really hard, did not get a pay packet. And he thought, I don't like doing this. These people in England, they just exploit migrants. I work harder than anybody else, but still I get no pay packet. But on Friday morning, his wife said, well, you've got nothing else to do. You might as well go to the building site and work. And he did. And on Friday, he didn't work hard at all. In the middle of the day, the boss took him into the office and gave him this big pay packet. And he was so happy. And when he went home, he told his wife, I finally understood how things work in the UK. From now on, I'm only going to go to work on Fridays, <laughs> on payday. <laughs> Now, that's exactly what happens when people, they think they've got a nice deep meditation, so they're going to be paid every day. Unfortunately, you have discovered it doesn't work like that. Your insight tells you that you build up the credit in your meditation. Even those things you think as bad meditations, there's no such thing as a bad meditation. It can be hard work and maybe get no paycheck, but you're building up your momentum. And then one day it happens, you get the paycheck. So these are some of the insights which you can develop. But how can you make that paycheck more frequent? You learn from your experiences and even from your bad med so-called bad meditations. You learn from those. So how not to meditate? Little things like trying to force your body. Well, I would try that many times when I was a young monk, trying to sit for long periods of time, trying to beat my PB, my personal best of how long I could meditate for, even doing stupid things like during these meditation retreats, you know, the personal ones, I would, because I was a young monk, I decided I'm going to be the last one in the meditation hall in the evening. And so I made that resolution. And after the usual talk and meditation was over, I stayed in the hall to keep meditating so I could fulfill my purpose to be the last one out of the meditation hall. And after about half an hour, when my legs were starting to hurt, I'd open one eye. There's a couple of ladies in the corner. They were still there. So I closed my eye again. And then another quarter of an hour, I opened my eye. They were still there after about 45 minutes. I don't know who they thought they were, but I was very angry at them. And then I opened my eye again. One of them had left. There's still one more to leave. <laughs> you know what it's like? That was absolutely stupidity. Just trying to keep a resolution, even though it was a stupid resolution. Eventually, that last one left. And as soon as they left, I ran to my room to lay down and go to sleep. 
I don't know if you've ever done that, just comparing yourselves to others. You cannot compare yourself to anybody else in the room, which is one of the insights, which is marvelous, is sometimes you feel tired and go to bed. And sometimes you've got lots of energy. Get up and meditate. Don't look at the other people in the room. Just be kind to oneself. You've got nothing to prove. That trying to prove yourself to others, again, is one of those other things which causes so much tension and stress in the body. The insights start coming up in your meditation, like one of those insights that sometimes people feel, this guy actually, he came up and said he had these nimittas. They said one time he, he had a nimitta, he felt like he was a, a marquee. You know, the marquees, you know, they have on parties and stuff. And he said other days he felt he was a, a, a teepee. You know what the indigenous Indians, United States used to live in. And he said, what's going on? It's really weird sort of images in my mind. And of course, I said, it's really obvious what your, what your problem is. Sometimes you experience yourself as a wigwam, sometimes as a, as a marquee. You're just too tense. <laughs> yeah, it's a terrible joke. <laughs> but you should get the insight now. <laughs> this is our jump I'm teaching. <laughs> and this is how I work. <laughs> so don't be too tense. Because you do find that tension inside you trying to get something, trying to go somewhere, trying to achieve something. That is a cause of stress. And it's not the way of meditation. Soon you get the insight, instead of trying to reach somewhere, go somewhere, or be somebody, you learn how to let things go. And that is a fantastic insight to learn how to let things go. And it gives you just so many understandings of the nature of this world and how to be a successful human being. And I, I don't know which story I've told, but uh, sometimes I if I had a visual aid, I'd hold up a cup of water. So imagine a cup of water. It's disappeared right now. Have you got a cup of water there now? We did do it. We did do it. Okay, we did do it. Which one? There's two similes with a cup of water. How to keep the water still in the glass. And also, how heavy is a cup of water? Which one did I do? How to keep it still. Okay. Imagine this is a cup of tea. That's even better. A good cup of a strong Sri Lankan tea with tin kiri. If you don't know what tin kiri is, you can actually ask it a question time afterwards. It's very delicious. It, it's traditional. <laughs> it's traditional Sri Lankan tea. So you're holding the cup. How heavy is the cup of tea? The longer you hold it, the heavier it feels. And after ten minutes, if you still hold the tea, you'll start. Your arm will start to ache. You'll be in pain. What's the problem? It's because you don't know how to let it go, to put it down. And you only need to put it down for one minute. And you pick it up again, and it feels much lighter. And that's a wonderful insight into the stress which people experience in their life. Have you got stress in your job, in your work? If you do, try. When you feel very uncomfortable doing whatever you're doing, your brain is getting stuffed up, turn off the computer, put down whatever you're doing and rest for half an hour. Meditation is the best way of doing that. Give yourself half an hour of free time. And then when you go back to your work, you go back to your computer screen, you find because you've rested that you are far more productive. <laughs> well, words and sentences and ideas come out much more freely. Instead of sitting there and just thinking, what's that word? And that sentence doesn't sound right. That email's no good. Instead of that, you can actually write so fast because your brain has taken a rest. So what happens is you, afterwards you get three hours work done in two. You've wasted half an hour, not wasted uh, in meditation. 
but you make it up afterwards by greater output. And I mentioned that so many years ago in a computer conference. Believe it or not, and many of you have seen me trying to use a computer and I'm hopeless at it, but I actually got invited to give the keynote address uh, the, I think it was 2009 or 2010, World Computer Conference in Daejeon in South Korea. And when I got there in my robes, all these really you know, top high-tech people, I know my, one of the guys I was talking to, he was the head of cybersecurity for the European Union. So these weren't sort of you know, little guys, these were big uh, experts in computing. And of course, when he saw me, he said, what are you doing here? I don't know, but they invited me. And I gave my keynote address, and that was one of the things I said in the keynote address, why so many people in the top echelons of society get stressed out, because they don't know how to put things down and rest. And if they did, they'd become far more efficient and less stressed out. So this is one of the things we learn in meditation, to take a break, to relax and rest. In Harvard Business School, apparently it's called an investment of time. Give half an hour for relaxation. Meditation is one of the best relaxations. And you make it up in the afternoon with higher quality work. So anyway, that's one of the reasons why the next time there's a retreat on, you can quote that story, get the references for it, and then get the next time you go on a retreat, get it paid for by your boss at work. So this is going to make me a much more efficient worker. Yeah, it's worth a try. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that as we meditate more and more, we don't just get still, we get wiser. As I mentioned, those five hindrances get weakened together with uh, this discontent and weariness also mentioned in the Nalakapana Sutta, they get weakened too. So as you meditate more and more, it's not just for stillness, it's you get a clearer mind and a more energetic mind. And of course, that's what's needed for insight. So as you do meditate, you get a little bit of stillness and the stillness makes the insight more available which means you can get more still, which can get more insight, which means you can get more still. And the insight and the stillness work together. The reason why I focus on stillness rather than insight is because everybody thinks they know the Dhamma, believe it or not, everyone thinks they're right. When you argue with people about what the Buddha said, I'm amazed. Just know how people can read a sutta and get it totally the wrong way around. And of course, I've already mentioned why. is because when you aren't still, when your hindrances are strong, they can distort the truth. And so you really think well, what you're seeing is, is correct, but it's not. But when you are still and the hindrances start to become weak, then you can trust what you see much more. A little example of this, and as you know, I don't just teach. I wouldn't be able to teach unless I had some integrity behind me and I meditated myself. And so during the my recent, I would do a 15-day personal retreat during the rains. You know, that rains retreat from July to October usually. And when I started my first so when I started my meditation retreat this year, first day was okay. The second day, it seemed that you got into a into a stoppage, you're hitting a wall. I didn't know what was going on. And so whatever happens, whenever you are meditating, there's a blockage or something, I always have learned to use wisdom at that point. And to me, wisdom is not just keeping on going the same direction, but to stand back. This is a metaphor, to stand back and look what's happening, what's going on. To see if you can find some attitude of mind which is blocking you. Because all these processes of meditation 
they are an automatic natural process, as the Buddha said. It's, you know, after a while, the only thing you can do is you know, do something which is blocking the progress of meditation. So I looked, and of course, once you look, you see straight away the insight comes up. And there was a little phrase which I've told many people about in so many years, over so many years. And that phrase was, when you want something more, you cannot enjoy what you already have. A very simple uh, way of uh, relating the first noble truth of suffering and the second noble truth together. When you want something more, you cannot enjoy what you already have. And I did not need to uh, start doing that. As soon as you saw that, I realized that I was wanting something more. And as soon as I stopped wanting anything, I could enjoy where I already was. And it got very, very deep from there on. The place started just pouring in. And it was such a, a sudden and amazing experience that it started you know, me thinking about the power afterwards, the power of insight to get you more still. You realize it was the wanting which was causing me the trouble. And at that time, I couldn't see it. In all of these insights, which leads to deeper meditation, it's not something you do. For those of you who have read a lot of suttas and understand the way the Buddha taught, often that people were meditating, and then this, uh, you may think it's a real thing or it's a metaphor, it doesn't really matter. But this, this being called Mara would come in and try and disturb the monk or the nun or the lay person for meditating. But when Mara came in, <coughs> it, when Mara came to actually see the Buddha, to try and disturb the Buddha, when the Buddha saw Mara, the Buddha never, as they say in the United States, kicked butt. He never pushed Mara away, never used any type of violence or aggression. The only thing the Buddha would do was to say, I know you, Mara. And that's all. It's a wonderful insight, that wisdom. I know you, Mara. And as soon as he said that, the Mara hunched his shoulders, drooped his head, and trudged off. The monk, the nun, knows me. Those problems were not uh, solved through force or through aggression. They were solved simply through insight, through knowing. I know you, Mara. And that is also the way that we overcome our, again, defilements, which hinder our meditation. When you are meditating, what do you want? When I start meditating, I make sure I don't want anything. Because I know that all wanting and all things gained by wanting are just burdens which will hinder my sense of freedom. Instead of wanting something, I just make sure if anything, any wants come up, I look at them and say, I know you, Mara. Give up all wanting and understand what freedom means. That's one of the reasons when I gave that guided meditation the other day on imagining you're the Buddha. You may say give up wanting. Is it possible? What happens if you give up wanting? It gave you a taste of freedom, as they say. Freedom from what? Freedom from wanting from discontent. And part of that freedom for wanting, it is kindness, loving kindness. And that's one of the reasons why the best definition of loving kindness, and the one which I use almost all the time now, is that story of opening the door of your heart. The story which came from my own father, 
when he took me aside as a 14-year-old boy and said, however you turn out in your life, son, I want you to remember the door of my house will always be open to you. The house was a small council flat in Acton. It was really small. And then we were very poor. I do remember people coming to the door and taking away some bit of furniture because we couldn't keep up with the payments. I also remember that time when two, two policemen knocked at the door. Is your dad at home? I said, yeah, he's at home. And so they went in to talk with him. And then a few minutes later, another two policemen knocked at the door and went in. And then a few minutes later, another two policemen came to see my father. And I thought, my father's not a violent man. Why do you need six or eight police you know, to talk to him? And I really got worried. I must have only been about five or six years of age at the time. But then I went into the room to see what they were doing. And they weren't trying to arrest my dad. All they were doing was watching the TV. It was the cup final day. They were supposed to be on the beat. But one of them knew my, my dad and said, they said, it's okay, come to your place to watch the cup final. No one will find us in there. And so that's all they were doing. They're watching the football all day <laughs> instead of being out on the beat. But it really scared me as a young kid. I really remember that. But anyway, it was a poor home. There wasn't much to open the door to. That wasn't a point. I realized that it wasn't a material opening which my father was giving me. He was actually saying the door of his heart was open to me. And the most important part of that was no matter what I ever did. It was unconditional love and acceptance. And I only realized that after he passed away. When I was a monk, I was a monk who had more time to actually to reflect on things. And that was an important part of my life and I had a chance to understand what he meant. And that became the idea of unconditional loving kindness. To give this beautiful loving kindness, expecting nothing back in return, not doing anything, not trying to change anything, but just to care for it. And that was very important. Later on in life, Understanding the power of such loving kindness, it helped save the career of one of my disciples over in Perth. He was one of these young men, his parents had brought him to the temple when he was very small. And he used to come to the Dhamma school where he'd teach him all sorts of lessons. And then later on, he did well at school, at university, studied medicine, became a doctor. And he was like an intern at one of the hospitals in Perth. And he came to see me just at lunchtime. And he said that something had happened that morning and he was going to resign from being a doctor, try and find some other career. And it kind of shocked me and disappointed me. Why are you giving up this career? You've worked so hard for it. Why give up? And that's when he told me the story that that very morning, one of his patients, this young woman of about 23 years of age, had died with one of his patients. She died unexpectedly. And he had the feeling of guilt, even though that was not deserved at all. And no one actually knew what happened until after they did the checks and found it was some natural phenomena which had killed her. But then he had to tell the husband and their two young children that the husband had no wife anymore and the children had no mummy to look after them. And he said that was one of the most painful experiences he'd ever had in his whole life. Just uh, giving that bad news to the husband and the two kids. And that shocked him so much. He said, I can't ever face a possibility of doing that ever again. I have to find some other job. And of course, that's when I just taught him that you've misunderstood the main priority, the main purpose of being a doctor. 
if any of you are psychologists, nurses, therapists, or whatever. Your main job is not to cure your patients. It is to care for them. If you think that you have to be a, someone who cures, you will always fail from time to time. You can't always cure people. But you can always care for them. Caring is more important than curing. He's very smart. He trusted me. He knew me for so long. He got the message. He went back to work and he became a very successful doctor, a specialist in giving colonoscopies. I always remember that because if any of the monks, the doctor says, I think you need a colonoscopy, I usually refer them to, to this fellow and he usually does them for free. <laughs> He said, well, you saved my career, Ajahn Brahma. I can't see why I can't sort of help your monks and nuns. And so the main point of that was caring. The wisdom of caring is more important than curing. So why did I spend time on that story? It's because I don't know what defilements you have. I don't know what um, hindrances you have more than anything else. But do you ever try to cure those defilements and those problems and those hindrances? If you do, you find you're going in the wrong direction. Don't try and cure them. Care for them. It takes in a totally different direction, in a direction which is far more productive. The insight comes that the care leads to the stillness, not the curing. Curing is far too aggressive. And it also has too much you know, negativity, not wanting these things. And too much sense of wanting something else. You care for them and you learn from them. And then those things disappear. Even I did mention this in brief on one of the questions. When I went to see Ajahn Chah, oh, actually a couple of times, the first time was when the local village in Bungwai in Thailand, they never had electricity, but they discovered generators. And they're having a party or some big celebration. So they, they hired some generators and some loudspeakers and some, I forget what it was, turntables or something to have these big music parties. And they would go on. You know, from uh, maybe when it got dark after dinner, maybe seven, eight o'clock, and then they go on till about two o'clock in the morning. By two o'clock, they get tired and sleepy and they turn off the electricity and have a rest. They didn't realize in the monastery, we would actually, the morning bell would go at 3 a.m. So we'd only get one hour sleep, if lucky, every night. And so we asked the, the villagers, can you actually turn the music off at, say, 1 a.m., give us a bit of an extra time to have a sleep? No. So then we sent a delegation to Ajahn Chah. A few of the senior monks went there. We thought if what Ajahn Chah says, they were scared of him. So they made we made sure that we'd ask Ajahn Chah to tell the villagers, yeah, have a party. That, you know, you're lay people. Please, that's okay. But please make sure you finish by one. You know what Ajahn Chah said? It's amazing wisdom. He said, it's not, the it's not the noise disturbs you. It's you who disturb the noise. It's not what we wanted to hear. It was so true. And that was just the start of many ways of seeing wisdom. If you're meditating, it's a noisy atmosphere around you. Is it the noise disturbs you? Or are you? disturbing the noise. And you'll find it's Ajahn Chah was right. You disturb the noise. You know, sometimes noise thinks, you know, I can't meditate. There's too much noise around. But you ask a few people who like, like watching football or watching movies. They can be watching that football, they can be watching that movie, and you tell them, dinner's ready, Someone's at the door, they're not ignoring you, they can't hear you. They're absorbed in like the soccer jhana. 
It's not really in China, but you can understand what I mean. <laughs> the movie absorption. And they can't hear what's outside. You can do that. So it asks a question, is it the noise disturbing you or do you disturb the noise? Or like with mosquitoes, mosquitoes were terrible in Northeast Thailand. I don't know why Ajahn Chah did this. I'm glad he did. It taught me a wonderful lesson that when we started this monastery, Wat Pa Nana Chat, six of the monks started it. I was the most junior of those six. And for some reason or another, Ajahn Chah would come every evening to try and get some interest in that monastery, but we'd always have a meditation from about 6 to 8 p.m. And then he'd give a talk. And a couple of hours of meditation. But that was in the jungle. And that was at a time, 6 to 8 p.m., was mosquito feeding time. And so that was the time all the mosses would come out. And if you look at, like, a monk, I've got a, a, a robe over my shoulder right now. You've seen the monks in Burma, in Thailand, in Sri Lanka. A lot of the times they have bare shoulders, bare shoulders, bare arms, bare head. So I said, we've got many more seats at the dinner table for mosquitoes than other people have. And not only that, there were so many Western monks at this monastery. And I think you know when a new type of food comes out, people always want to try it. So this was the first time that Western food came to the jungles of Northeast Thailand. So that's why I thought... All the mosquitoes were coming onto the Western monks, and hardly any were on the Asian monks at all. That's really unfair. And there were many as well, because with an American monk who was a friend of mine, that we would actually, it was very hard to watch your breath. So we played a little game of counting how many mosquitoes we could count on our arms and heads. And it's no exaggeration. You know, as a monk, you have to be honest. It was about 60 or 70 or 80 at the time. A large number of mozzies. And you felt like just jumping up and running away. But, you know, Ajahn Chah was there. So, you know, you felt you couldn't. And that was very hard to bear. But then, you know, that they taught me so much. One of the things they taught me is that when I started meditating to make sure I didn't waste any time. I didn't allow my mind to go wandering off into stupid things. When I sat down, I did relax the body. I did watch the breathing. And of course, what happens if you do the meditation properly? Then after a while, your body disappears. You can't feel it anymore. And you have a nice peaceful meditation. That's where I really learned how to do that, because I had to. Otherwise, it was intolerable. So because of that, I thank those mozzies for teaching me how to let go. One of the weird things which happened was that um, when you came out of the meditation, you know, you look, I looked at my arms, there's the things on my hands, I couldn't see any mosquito bites on there at all. And for many years, I thought this is one of the psychic powers of meditation. Even the mosquito bites, they can't penetrate your skin or something. It was only much later I found out that mosquitoes, many mosquitoes, and obviously the ones in Northeast Thailand were part of this type of mosquito, they are attracted to the carbon dioxide coming out of your skin. That shows you that you're there. So when you meditate and your metabolism goes down, it's like the mosquitoes can't find you. That's why they didn't get many bites. Not psychic power, but just ordinary science. But nevertheless, those mosquitoes taught me how to watch my breath. So these little insights which come up, you know, you think that why am I doing this? There must be some other way. Maybe there is. But when you care, rather than trying to cure, you learn so much more. It's as if these obstacles, these defilements, they come up and they're teaching you something. 
Rajan Chah told me to call them Ajahn Mosquito. They're teaching you something. And once you've learned the lesson, then that problem is not there anymore. And of course, that kindness is so powerful and important. So much so that I remember, I don't know why this happens, but Westerners, when they meditate, they always tend to exaggerate. So I remember this one Westerner coming to see me, and they said they didn't just have one of the five hindrances, they had all the five hindrances, all of the same type. Now, of course, you can't have sloth and torpor and restlessness at the same time. You can't have wanting and not wanting and doubt at the same time. But that's what they were saying. They're really having a difficult time in their meditation. An attack of all the five hindrances. What do you do? And I used an example uh, from the suttas, from the story of the Buddha, and I called it the Nalagiri strategy. If ever that happens to you, you've got so many hindrances, your meditation is really going bananas, or really going just uh, uh, almost impossible. Nalagiri was this big elephant which was fed alcohol, was let loose in the path of the Buddha, trying to kill the Buddha. And so you can imagine these big elephants running down these narrow streets, you know, which was, and the Buddha was coming on arms right in the other direction. A big crazy elephant and a gentle Buddha walked with his attendant Ananda. And all the lay people, they saw this elephant was destroying and killing and breaking everything in its path. They said, get out of the way. There's a mad elephant coming. And a lot of the monks, so sort of jumped over the walls, you know, went into houses to escape. I remember people asked afterwards the question, why did all those monks show fear and run away? No nuns, apparently. <laughs> why did they all run away? And of course, <laughs> this smart talking monk later on said, oh, that was to show just the power of the Buddha. He didn't need anybody except himself and Ananda. It was all done on purpose. They weren't afraid. They were just making the scene for this wonderful story. So then it was just the Buddha and Ananda facing this mad elephant charging towards them. And that's the point when Ananda stood in front of his master. Let the elephant crush me. I donate my life to my beloved master. And sometimes when I get to this point in the story, I ask each one of you, would you do that for me <laughs> if I was in front of an elephant? <laughs> but anyway, Ananda did. And so the Buddha very calmly pushed Ananda out of the way. It's okay, Ananda, I can handle this. And there was just the Buddha. And the Buddha was quite older this time. And just this wild, strong, intoxicated elephant they were going to meet. And what do you think happened? Remember the Buddha had amazing powers. I have no doubt about that. He could have grabbed the elephant by the trunk, twirled him three times around his head. We always do things three times in Buddhism. And then throw him over the Ganges River, which was a long distance away. But he wouldn't do that. I reckon the Buddha would have thought something like, Elephant, the door of my heart is open to you. No matter what you ever do to me, I will never take away my compassion and kindness towards you. Give him so much unconditional, unlimited loving kindness. I'm not sure exactly what the Buddha thought, but it was something like that because the elephant stopped charging. The elephant stopped charging and was standing in front of the Buddha with his head bowed so the Buddha could stroke his trunk. There, there, Nalagiri, never mind. The door of my heart would always be open to you, great elephant. And that was the end of that story. How this huge elephant was subdued not through aggression or violence, 
but by powerful care and loving kindness. And that's one of the reasons why, if ever you have a very aggressive attack of the hindrances or any other defilements, please never try to fight those hindrances. Don't try to kick butt against those hindrances or use your willpower. Use your caring power. Say to the attack of all the five hindrances, hindrances, the door of my heart is open to you. With unconditional love, you can come in if you want and see what happens. That is the wisdom way to overcome the defilements and the hindrances to meditation. That's the best way. That's the Buddha's way. Okay, once again, I've talked too much. It's uh, seven minutes past nine. Two. Two nine, okay. So we can have a break, a cup of tea or whatever you need. And then afterwards we can do a guided meditation. Should if you just like ten past. Or ten past, yeah. Give if you meet extra at, time. A bit of extra time. If you meet any elephants on the way to the toilet, remember be kind to them. Okay. Have a nice cuppa. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed going to the letting go room. Excellent. So let's get started. A few people are still absent. But that is fine. They'll join in soon. Oh, they're not held back yet. Yeah, because we said 10 past. Well, it's close to 10 past. Well, close enough. Let's just check. Most people are back. All the important ones are back. <laughs> when I tell that gets the trouble. Well, no, because the ones that are there, those who won't hear it. Yeah, <laughs> they just come in the door. <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay, let's get going. Here we go. <clears throat> so, uh, just a quick bit of guidance. Please excuse me when I do guided meditation. As I keep telling you, I always meditate with you. And so soon I get so deep, I just can't bring myself to say anymore. So I'm sorry if it's a bit short guided meditation for you. But I see even like doing some chanting. And some chants I cannot do. And one of those is like the four Brahma Viharas. Because I tried it many times, and we get even just the first Brahma we hire chant, and it gets so blissed out that I'm following it, and it just inspires me, and I just can't say anymore. So if I stop talking, please understand why. It's not that I've forgotten the words. It's just I'm enjoying myself too much, and I just can't stop it. So anyhow, here we go. On This is a meditation. And again, we start off with just the ordinary meditation, just on uh, setting up the reasons why you're doing this. This is not for gaining special powers. It's not to achieve some sort of goal and get more things for yourself in life. This is to see how much can vanish and disappear. So you feel more and more free and more and more peaceful, more and more still. You know it's wisdom if it gives rise to peace. It is the insights which can stop and undermine the hindrances. When you want something more, you cannot enjoy what you already have. And the enjoyment of where you are and what you already have is crucial to being able to go deep into the meditation. You never go on to the next stage of meditation. You go deeper in to where you already are. And that's where you find the deeper stages of meditation. So you close your eyes. 
The eyes close. Just have a quick check through your body. Use your wisdom to relax your body. And your wisdom to know what relaxation is. You're lessening as much tension and fear in your body as you possibly can. And if you do have any aches and pains or persistent tensions in the body, you're always the same place, call that a teacher. You'll learn so much from those obstacles of meditation. And you'll strengthen parts of your uh, spiritual powers. And your insight will grow. You know it's insight growing because the meditation gets more peaceful. The sign of insight is peace. The sign of peace is insight. And as you're still keeping some attention on the body, just to ensure that everything is as comfortable as it can be. And for me right now, this, I can feel tightness on my belt. So I'm going to loosen it. It's a little bit of disturbance. A little bit of disturbance now is worth it to save a lot of disturbance and discomfort later. And it's also my body knows that I care for it. My mind will know that I care for it. Sometimes if you're with somebody who really cares, you don't want to leave them. You may go away for a short while. You'll always come back because you're staying with a good friend. So be a good friend to your body. Then you're a good friend to your mind. So you can ask your body as if the body was independent from you. It's not yours. You ask it, is there anything I can do for you, body, to make you more comfortable? Anything. Again, when I say to you, I do myself. Um, please excuse me, my right ear is very itchy. So please don't look. Feels so much better, honestly. And it's just like your body feels safe. During meditation, no unworldly spirits or anything can hinder you at all. To get into deep meditation, you have to have a purity of heart. And that purity is the best thing to protect you from anything which is harmful or hurtful. Even animals can't hurt you. They're alone invisible spirits. Then as you're sitting here, when the body is relaxed, we can incline our mind, our attention to the inside, 
Imagine your body like this big container and inside of it are your mental faculties. The knowing and the doing. So what are you aware of right now? Whatever it is that you are aware of right now, it's already here. Never say it is wrong or it shouldn't be here. It is here. And see if you can regard the contents of this present moment as the most important meditation object in the whole world. That will help you regard it with confidence. They can be truly mindful of it. If you're trying to get rid of this moment, you'll never find peace. So make, make peace with what you are aware of right now. And be kind to it. Be gentle with it. It may not be the breath or any meditation object you've ever read about, but it's here right now. When you're kind to it, making peace with it, it relaxes and it becomes just so soft and it leads you into deeper meditation objects. You don't need to give it a name, what you're experiencing right now. Don't be concerned with what it's called. Be concerned with how it feels. and inquisitiveness. And if you do this with kindness, you can usually notice there's an underlying feeling of tranquility. You're not struggling to get somewhere. You are caring for something which is right in front of you, this moment. If it's something you think is not allowed, you're not trying to cure it. You're caring for it. And that softness of attitude, it's wonderful, even joyful caring, can cure anything. It just takes time. You have all the time in the world. Just being here, not trying to get rid of things, but humble enough to learn from whatever's happening now. If the breath happens to come up, fine. But you don't want to own the breath and capture it. Comes in, maybe stays for a few breaths, they may want to go. Fine. When you say that the door of my heart's open to you, doors are to come in and doors are also for going out. So leave the door wide open. And your goal is to maintain this beautiful, non-controlling, non-judging, non-wanting attitude of kindness to whatever's happening in the moment.
You don't have to try to remember anything. You will recall. The meditation experiences are always much clearer. So you can recall them with ease. There's one less thing you have to do. All you need to do is to be here and be kind and mindful.
It is now 10 o'clock here in UK. So it's time to come out from the meditation if you wish. And so I hope you had an enjoyable and useful morning. And we'll see you again this afternoon. Bye-bye.